In Birmingham, Alabama, 60 years ago, black students, some still in elementary school, marched for an end to segregation. They were met with police dogs, fire hoses, and handcuffs. Today, three people who can remember those events because they themselves were students right here in Birmingham. Businesswoman Mary Bush, University President Freeman Herbofsky, and former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice on Uncommon Knowledge Now. And so my friends, they did not die in vain. God still has a way of wringing good out of evil. And history has proven over and over again that unmerited suffering is redemptive. Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. Mary Bush grew up in segregated Birmingham, then went on to a career in finance and business that saw her earn an MBA from the University of Chicago, work at Citibank in Chase, Manhattan, serve in the Treasury Department during the Reagan administration, sit on the boards of companies including Marriott and Texaco, and found Bush International, the consulting firm, which she now serves as president. Freeman Hrubowski III grew up right across the street from Mary Bush, he went on to a career in academia, earning a doctorate in higher education administration and statistics from the University of Illinois. Beginning in 1992, Dr. Robofsky served as president of the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, one of the 12 universities in the University of Maryland system. During his tenure, UMBC became the number one producer in the nation of African Americans who went on to complete STEM PhDs. Dr. Hrabowski stepped down as president of UMBC just last year. Condoleezza Rice grew up here in Birmingham in the same neighborhood as Mary Bush and Freeman Hrabowski. She went on to earn a doctorate in international relations from the University of Denver. She then went on to a career at Stanford University that saw her rise to provost and that she interrupted to serve during the administration of George W. Bush as national security advisor and secretary of state. Secretary Rice now serves as director of the Hoover Institution, the Public Policy Center at Stanford. We're gathered in Birmingham today in the Westminster Presbyterian Church, where the pastor in the 1960s was the Reverend John Wesley Rice Jr., Condi's father. I've only been here a day and a half, but it seems to fall to me to welcome the three of you back to your hometown <laughs> in Birmingham. <clears throat> the spring of 1963, April 3rd, a local civil rights organization, the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights, led by Birmingham's own Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth, is joined by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s Southern Christian Leadership Conference in conducting sit-ins at downtown lunch counters. April 6th, Reverend Shuttlesworth leads a march on City Hall. More than 30 protesters are arrested. April 11, Dr. King is served with an injunction against boycotting, trespassing, or encouraging such acts. April 12th, Dr. King, Reverend Shuttlesworth, and others lead a march protesting the injunction. They're arrested. April 14th, Easter Sunday, a thousand protesters attempt to march on City Hall. Police block their way, arresting more than 30. April 19, the New York Post publishes excerpts of a document that Dr. King, using fragments of newspapers, has composed in what would soon become known as the letter from Birmingham jail, Dr. King writes, quote, I cannot sit idly by in Atlanta and not be concerned about what happens in Birmingham. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Anyone who lives in the United States can never be considered an outsider. May 2nd, young blacks begin leaving school to march they walk in groups of 10 to 50 across Kelly Ingram Park, the city square, intending to protest at City Hall just a few blocks away. They never reach City Hall. The Birmingham Commissioner of Public Safety, Bull Connor, orders his men to assault the students with fire hoses and police dogs. Many of the young people are injured. More than 1,000 are arrested. May 10th, a settlement is reached under the terms of the Birmingham Truce, Dr. King, Reverend Shuttlesworth, and other civil rights leaders agree to end the protests. Birmingham business leaders promise in turn that within 90 days they will desegregate businesses and public facilities. For the most part, they keep their word and official segregation in Birmingham 
Unofficial segregation would continue for a long time, but official segregation in Birmingham comes, for the most part, to an end. That's not by any means the means of the story, and we'll continue to what happened afterwards. But for now, let me ask you about those events, what, what is now referred to often as the Children's Crusade. You're the last generation who experienced the Old South and the Civil Rights Movement that rose against it. Mary Bush, you were only in your teens, but if I understand this correctly, you heard Dr. King speak. I did. Tell us about what he was like, what it meant to this town when he came here. The time that I heard Dr. King speak uh, was at my church, Sixth Avenue Baptist Church. That the federal government not put a cent in this city unless it decides to face the realities of desegregation. The church was absolutely packed. My parents and I went, and um, it was really a momentous event. Uh, because here was Martin Luther King, who had become well-known for his um, civil rights activities. He was a famous figure coming to he town. Was, he was a famous figure coming to town. Um, so it, was, it made a, a huge impression on me, uh, one, to hear him speak and to talk about freedom. Um, when the children's marches were organized, I wanted very much to participate. Uh, but I had a father who, um, when he meant, said something, he meant it. He said, no, you cannot go. Um, however, uh, I will tell you one other part of the story. As you probably know, my friend Freeman Robowski did participate. It's a very interesting story as to how he got to do it, which maybe he'll tell you. But he was arrested. And uh, I came home from somewhere one day, and my father is in our front yard, and there are tears strolling down his face. And I said, Daddy, what's wrong? And he said, Freeman has been arrested. Well, you see, Freeman was like his child, too. Freeman lived across the street. Uh, or he lived right across the street from me. So my father was in much distress because he didn't know what was going to happen to Freeman because this was a city that reacted to people trying to get their freedom in very violent ways. So Freeman, Mary's father said, no, you're not marching. Right. Did you get your parents' permission? Did you march in spite? What, what, uh, one <laughs> of the, let, me, let me explain the question. Yeah. It's easy, looking back on these events 60 years ago, to think that the black community rose as one. Well, you were united. But there were hard decisions to make every day. There was right. violence all around. This notion of children marching was not easy. Dr. King himself resisted it for a number of days before deciding it had to be done. So how did, your fa how did you and your family address that? You were how old at this stage? I was 12. 12, I was 12. years old. Yeah. You were still a child. Yeah, but so I, was, I was in the ninth grade. I was about to go to the 10th grade. I had skipped a couple of grades. And I should tell you that most people saw Dr. King as a certainly a hero, but he was also a troublemaker. He was going to change things. People don't realize that, in that it was uncomfortable. People were worried, particularly people who were maybe buying houses. The word had gone around that, my goodness, banks could pull mortgages. Oh. Right? People were saying, we don't know what's going to happen. You know, it wasn't like everybody was saying, this is the right thing to do. When you look back on it, it seems like this was all a good idea. No, people were very confused about what to do and about sending children out. So it wasn't a given that, oh, this is the right thing to do. They were proud of the idea we're doing something. But no, we went home. I didn't want to go to church anyway. I, who wants to go to church in the middle of the week? I was rebellious kid. And they placated me by letting me take my math. I love the math. Reverend Rice knew I, I love the math. So I'm sitting in the back doing my math. And this man at the lectern says, if the children participate, uh, they'll go to better schools. Now, we loved our teachers, but we always had been told the white schools were better. We wanted to see what that was all about. And I wanted to see if they were as smart as people said they were, because I knew I was smart. Because to me, smart meant you could work hard, right? And you could, you could solve the math problems. So I'm doing my algebra, and this guy says this, and I look up, and it, of course, it's Dr. King. And here's the point. 
I went home and I said, I want to go. And they said, what? Absolutely not. Same reaction, Mary. Absolutely not. And I said to my parents, in typical Freeman form, you guys are hypocrites. You made me go. I listened. And now you say no. And what, what will your parents say? Go to your room. Because you are not supposed to tell your parents they're hypocrites, right? And so I was punished. They sent me to my room. The next morning they came in. They had not slept. They prayed all night. I knew I was in trouble. And they said to me with real distress on their faces, it wasn't that we didn't trust you. We don't trust the people who will be over you. Because if you march, you're going to jail. Mm -hmm. But we're going to put you in God's hand. Now, my students say, Doc, you must have been really brave. I was not a brave child. If a, if a fight broke out at school, Freema was running the other way. The only <laughs> thing I'd ever attacked in my life was a math problem. You get that, right? But I did want a better education. My teachers were wonderful. We did not have the resources. We didn't understand what great education might be. We didn't understand what it might be. But I did go. And it was a, a horrific experience. They treated us like slaves, like animals. Too many kids, stinky, not enough bathrooms. This is in prison? In, yeah, in the jail. So, so what yeah. was it like when, the, when you were marching? It was, it was both inspiring and frightening. Can I, can I, this yeah. is the thing, this is, <clears throat> these are hard questions to ask. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know if you noticed this, but I'm white. That makes it very, very, <laughs> very uncomfortable. <laughs> but I keep thinking. These and we're in Birmingham, Alabama. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and we are in Birmingham. But what was it like to have an encounter with a white person? What was it like not to be able to go to a certain store or during this event to have an encounter with the police? And you knew they were going to be against you just because you were black. How, mm -hmm. how do you avoid them? Do you shrink from it? How, how does yeah. this work? It's, you know, it's interesting that Dr. King's this is gone, the people. It's gone now, but you remember. No, no, all the people. And the two things I would say, we are all from privilege in that we had these wonderful parents, working mothers and fathers and of faith. Uh, we were going to church all the time. Sixth Avenue Baptist, Westminster, and, and her father, Reverend Rice, our beloved Reverend Rice, Reverend Porter, dear friend, and uh, Reverend Rice was our youth fellowship advisor. He was amazing, Presbyterian, who would come to Sixth Avenue. We would have these wonderful conversations about what it meant to be teenagers, right? And, uh, and, the idea, and talking about ideas in our honor society. He was an advisor to our honor society, right? And um, he was an intellectual. And we would have these, so, we, so in our community, we could talk about ideas. And yet we, you tell me about you all, but I'd never talked to anybody white. You never did? No, uh, the only time I remember a white person was we went to visit Santa Claus. Oh, yeah. And oh, yeah. Uh, I, was, I was five. Yeah, you, yeah. you would go down to Pizzits or down to uh, Loveman's to visit Santa Claus. And this particular Santa Claus was taking all the little black children and holding them out here. He was taking little white children and putting them on my, their knee, his knee. Now, you know my father. My father said to my mother, Angelina, if he does that to Condoleezza, I'm going to pull all that stuff off of him and show him to be the cracker that he is. <laughs> now, now, so there we're sitting there. You know, it's, it's, I'm five. Daddy, Santa Claus. Daddy, Santa Claus. <laughs> What a way to meet Santa Claus. And so um, that's Reverend Rice. And that was, so I think somehow Santa Claus could see my father, who was 6'3 and a football player. And when it came time, Santa Claus took me and he put me in his knee and said, Yes, little girl. So that was the only, the, but to your question, it's the only white person I'd ever seen. Can, that's context. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Before yeah. we depart, we'll return to it in a moment, but we, before we depart from the, those events in 1963, your father, as we've heard, was a beloved figure. Yes. He was reverend in this church. The black community was, as, I, as I've looked, it's about 100,000 people. It strikes me that the pastors, the ministers, must have known each other. They did. Yeah. So they your did. father knew Reverend Shuttlesworth. They were good friends. Good friends. Yes. yes. And 
course, you were a very little girl, but do you remember at the time these tensions? It's fascinating to me to think, once you think it, it seems obvious, but the assumption that, that there's this uprising of, of righteousness and peaceful, uh, nonviolent protest, but of course it was more complicated than that. Dr. King was an outsider, this notion of putting children in harm's way. Do you remember your father talking about that at home? I, I do remember my father talking about it. I was little, I'm you a little, little younger course. than these two. And um, I remember a couple of things about it. I remember my father saying to my mother, we're sitting, standing in our little hallway, you know, Angeline, I'm not gonna go down there and pretend to be nonviolent because if a policeman takes a billy club to me, I'm gonna try to kill him and my daughter will be an orphan. Because my father actually didn't believe in the nonviolent part. Hmm. Do you know who one of my father's great friends was? Stokely Carmichael. Really? He's some, yes. He somehow found in that more confrontational side something that he admired. And so when the Children's March came along, it was a little, a lot like Mary and, and Freeman's parents. My father said, why would you send children into Bull Connor's henchmen? Why would you do that? I wouldn't let my daughter go. And he was very much against the children's march. But when they were all, his students were all carted off to, to jail, he came down and he walked around. Uh, he had good relationship with the police. They let him walk around and he would call parents and say, I saw your daughter, she's and, fine, and I, I saw your son. more than a thousand kids yeah, yeah. were jailed. Yeah. Not too far from here. The jail was not and too he, far from here. he was one of, when I came back, he just, Two, three parts of the story to show you how close burning. Uh, first of all, the, the reason they allowed me to go was that I challenged my mother. My mother had led a protest in 1948 really? for the equalization of teacher salaries and was fired for that. And she was always proud of that in, in another county. And one of her best friends was the mother of Angela Davis. Really? Yeah. Uh, and my mother and Angela Davis's mother taught together over the years, and my mother taught Angela Davis and her sister, and my mother, and Angela Davis's mother taught me. Hmm. And they had this great sisterhood about fighting for justice, all right? And I reminded, I said, Mother, you, you fought for justice. She said, but I was an adult. And I said, but you taught me to think. And they did allow me to go. It was it was amazing. About her father, when I when I moved, when we, we did get back to school, he and George Bell gave me special attention to see how I was psychologically. And he said to me, Remember, you are an A student. You are an A student. He wanted me to remember that. He wanted me to remember how to define myself. It was very important. Just as Mr. Bell, who was the uncle of Alma Vivian Powell, General Powell's really? wife. You know, there's something else. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Something yeah. else you need to know about Dr. Bell. He yes. was the principal yes. of the Omen High School. Of the high school that we earlier, well, that Freeman and I both went to. Uh, Dr. Bell was an amazing man. Um, he was very much about excellence. He would come to our classes. He would give the students extra problems yeah. to solve, um, but he was also a disciplinarian. Yeah. So even the really big guys who might have a tendency to act out were cowered by Dr. Bell yeah. because he had small, this amazing yeah. voice. And he was a, he was a tiny man. <laughs> But we loved him uh, because he was all about hard work and excellence and always, you know, striving to be the best you could be. So when my class was going into its senior year, uh, Dr. Bell was about to retire. And we literally begged him not to retire. This shows you, one, um, how close the principals, the ministers yeah. that we've talked about, the teachers were to the students. So it was our parents yeah. who, who really pushed us about hard work and excellence and the value of education, but it was also our teachers and our principals. You had to be twice as good, right? Yeah. Twice as good, yeah. twice as good. So, so this, yes. so yeah. I'm just, I find this so striking <laughs> that here you are in the Jim Crow South and you've got parents who are wonderful parents. Yes. Yeah. 
and schools that are good schools. Yes, and, and good teachers. And good teachers, dedicated. Yeah. I mean, honestly, truly, I hear you describe the circumstances in which you grew up, mm -hmm. and I wouldn't hesitate, would not, now my children are older now, but I'd have dropped my children yeah. in segregate in Black Birmingham like that okay. because of yes. the education, the self-confidence. Yeah. Yes. But, but let me... So what am I missing Let me, let me what, step back a right. little bit because um, I, I want to say two things. First of all, about the principles. To be a principal mm. in a school in Birmingham yes. was like being a god. Exactly. We, we revered, my, position. revered position. So Alma Powell's father, Mr. R.C. Johnson, was the principal of uh, Parker High, which was the largest black school. Mm -hmm. And her uncle was the uh, principal of Ullman High, which was the second largest. When Mr. W.W. W. Whetstone, who was the principal of our elementary school, died, his funeral was like that for a head of state mm -hmm. because teachers were revered, principals were revered. But there was a, a dark under, underbelly to that, which is that if you were an educated black person, you really only had a couple of good options. Mm. And teaching was the best option. And so it was, in a sense, a, a lack of opportunity for black professionals that led to the best and brightest going into teaching. In another time... So that funeral, everybody understood this is a man who holds a position of importance to us, but he's also the best we have the produced. Best the we best we have of produced. Our community. They've, and and if see. you were a teacher, you were really highly regarded. And, and you know, in a, another generation or two, people would have other options and some would take With them. With few exceptions I, who became yeah. physicians and lawyers. The few, you had a couple of few, lawyers, a few mm -hmm. physicians. So, so, I call this the best minds. We got the best minds because just as Condi said, the generation before us, our parents and teachers, they didn't have the other opportunities. The doors were not open, so they became teachers. And we were the wonderful, blessed recipients of that. I see. But, but so, see, you know, but I want to go yep. back because you talk about your children coming here. It depends on what background your children would have had because, again, I want to say this. We were so privileged. They gave us the piano lessons, and we had books in the house. And, French lessons. And French lessons, and, you know, all of that. The symphony. The, 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 yeah, yeah. Which they, we couldn't they, go they, to, they, but they you know, did it at home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, we couldn't go into the museum. But my, my mother would get the, the pamphlets, and we would read stuff on the outside. But And so, so my parents sent me to Massachusetts to get extra education and to see what it would be like to be in classes with white kids in the summers that I saw the difference between the Southern education and, and the education in New England. And I saw the superiority in Massachusetts, you see, in chemistry, in literature. Mm -hmm. And here's the point. Uh, clearly, the money that they were putting into education in New England would make that education there far superior to any education in public schools for black or white. In Alabama, and you see it in the standardized test scores for children in general. You see, as I look at it, as I study test scores, whatever level, all right? Number one. Number two, when you look at beyond the, the well educated families, as we were from the, the working families, all right? When you look at poor children, white and black, in, in here or in America, but in, in Alabama, and you see what happens to those children back then and today. The future is not bright. That's but, the but, challenge. But Freeman, I want to just I want to challenge you Go on ahead. one thing Go and ahead. agree with you on mm -hmm. another. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure it was superior, right? That the New England education, mm -hmm. uh, because I'm not sure I could have turned out better if I'd gone to school in New England, or that no, you could, or that Mary could. And mm -hmm. I look at, you know, Amelia Rutledge, and I look at Cheryl yes. McCarthy, and well, you know, we, elite, for yeah, the best, for no, the but best. we, but we weren't mm -hmm. actually elite. We mm -hmm. were kind of professional class, middle class. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a more elite black community that lived over past Smithfield, mm. all right, I, so. But I'm looking at, I'm looking at, I'm particularly looking at math and science. Yeah. I'm looking at math and science, all right? I'm looking at chemistry, I'm looking at those areas, and I'm looking at, uh, for example, what was covered in chemistry in Massachusetts and what was covered here. And then I looked at what happened when I took some courses at the university here, at the white university compared to, to there. It was superior. 
as a mathematician, I'm saying. Uh, all that I'm saying is yeah. the resources may have been superior. Yeah, the resources I'm not sure that the and instruction was, was. And, and I'm going to tell you why. Yeah, yeah. Because I then went yeah. to Denver, yeah. Yeah. and I went to one of the best high schools in Denver, St. Yeah. Mary's Academy. Yeah. When we arrived in Denver, yeah. I went to St. Mary's Academy because my parents, who were educators, sure, sure. said the Denver public schools sure. are not as good uh -huh. as the schools that you went to in Birmingham. Well, let's right? say this. So they made that choice. I love the fact that we can disagree like that. Yeah. Because we also disagree <laughs> on philosophy and some yeah. other things. Yeah. And that, yeah. that, let me just say that. Let's, <laughs> let's, let's go there, too. Let's but, go but there, I, too. But, and I always say middle class Birmingham <laughs> may love each other in many ways, but politically and stuff, yeah. we have some differences but, here. But, but, but we have I, I agreed want, to disagree. But, I want, I but want let to me tell you, my brother, as wait, a mathematician, wait, wait, standardized wait. test scores, yeah. all you need to do is look <laughs> at standardized test scores in Massachusetts compared to Alabama, yeah. and my point is made, QED, yeah. math No, well, I don't right? know about standardized look test scores. Standardized I know where you ended up. But let me go back to a point, a place where I agree, but I want to extend the story, all right? So it is absolutely true that if you were poor, yeah, 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 uh, yeah, yeah. in the, the communities here where Mary and Freeman and others of our friends grew up, faith, family, education. Yes, all right? yes, yes. Faith was first, family was second. And we true. had we two parent families that cared, and then education. Right behind this church, there was yeah. a government project, as they called it in those days, called Loveman's Village. Mm -hmm. And those kids were poor. Yes. yes. But my parents and were determined that those kids were going to get <coughs> some of what they were able to give yes. me. And so my father would have, the, when he would have, uh, there was a dentist who came here on Tuesday nights to mm -hmm. do dentistry. Those to the church? To the church. Mm -hmm. Those kids got to come. When he had uh, math and uh, algebra tutoring yes. and French, those kids got to come. And Sixth Avenue has them. And, and yeah, Sixth so Avenue had those. Yes. Pro and so I don't want to give the impression that we just sat on our privilege. That's right. That's right. Our parents were determined that that privilege was going to be extended to those who might not otherwise have had so, it. I'd like to return to um, to the events of the spring of nineteen spring and autumn of nineteen sixty three. But can I just I want to go back to this notion of what deprivation you felt. You said that Santa held black children out here. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's something everybody can get. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You said your parents had to send you to New England mm -hmm. to and see. And they were geniuses. I want to say something that they wouldn't say, OK? Both of these young women, and I say this based on my own education, they're geniuses. So these of two course ladies? they did. Yeah, they both are geniuses. No, <laughs> they're just that damn good. Oh, okay. She's expression. Good. They, we're no, good. no, no, no. She's playing it down. But they, I mean, of course they went ahead and they, they, they had a great, a good, a solid education, but they're geniuses. Okay. They okay. are, so uh, they are, but they are. But, well, so what, they in, are. Your, what, what, in what way, I mean, I am conscious, yeah. I'm conscious that the year 1963 began in this state with the inauguration of George Corley Wallace, and he said, January 1963. Segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. I will never forget looking at it, that man's face when he told me I couldn't go to the University of Alabama. I was sitting in front of the TV crying. And you know what my mother said to me? You don't have time to be a victim. That's she right. said, wow. get the knowledge. You don't. When I was in Massachusetts, I called my parents and I said, they don't like me because you know all of my talking about the quality of the education, Nobody would speak to me there either. They wouldn't speak to me. The children wouldn't speak to me. The teachers wouldn't speak to me. I'd raise my hand when nobody else was raising them because I was getting an answer. I was 13 and they were 16, all right? I'd raise my hand. Yeah, I was precocious. And I'd have the answer. They'd look right through me. It was my first time understanding what, what Ellison meant by the invisible man. And I would be so hurt. I'd be raising my little fat hand trying to get them to get call on me. They would not call on me. I called my mom and dad, and I said, they don't like me. And she said, oh, how many more black kids in the class? I said, none. She said, how many people you think from Birmingham are there getting that education? I said, none. She said, you know I love you, right? I said, yeah. She said, have a seat. I sat down. She said, son, suck it up. <laughs> She said, suck it up, because you know what? The so world is not let's, there. Let's talk about so, so what, deprivation. How did, you ex how did you experience it in your life? How did you experience the deprivation? Deprivation, yes. Well, OK. I, I couldn't 
uh, drink water from a mm-hmm. white water fountain, but mm-hmm. there was a black water fountain. And I'll tell you a funny story. One of our other friends, Otto Stallworth, said that uh, he was downtown one day with his mom, and he sort of ran away from her while she was buying something, and he drank out of the white water fountain. And um, he ran back to her and said, Mommy, Mommy, their water tastes just like ours. Okay, so deprivation was not being able to go to a restaurant other than the one black-owned restaurant or a hotel other than the one black-owned hotel or to, Kitty, yes. Kitty, yeah. Yeah, or to Kitty Land Park. But what I found out years later, you know, after we could finally go to Kitty Land Park when I was an adult, I said, oh, I got to see it. It was horrible. It was dirty. It was <laughs> just unbelievable. So we were not really deprived, except for things that Freeman yeah. is yeah. talking about, uh, like going to some of the schools that we might have wanted to um, in Alabama. Um, so our parents made up for what would have been deprivation. We could only go to the symphony downtown one day a year. We could not. Blacks were allowed one day a year. Blacks were allowed one day a year. We could not go to the Birmingham Public Library downtown. We could only go to the community one, which is a few blocks from here. However, our parents made sure that we had exposure to the symphony, to classical music. Condi's mother and grandmother, yes. you know, taught her classical piano. Exactly. And um, some of my other friends, they were taught ballet. Um, so they, they made up for it. They made sure that we had, the, we read broadly and widely. I read so much, Freeman loves to tell this story, I almost burned our house down once. <laughs> With the flashlight or something under the cover. Oh, uh, yeah, a, a naked yeah. lamp bulb because I didn't want to stop reading. Yeah. So and, and after we were that, reading, we were reading broadly. We were doing it for the privileged right. kids. No, right. and the Freeman, I, I have to keep challenging All you on the privileged kids. All these children at school, our schools, our unfortunately. Parents, our parents were, I doubt my parents ever in their lifetime made more than $80,000 But relative together. to the oh, other blacks together. in our no, community, no, no, but, we but, were but privileged. Let's, but let's stick with this. Yeah, yeah. Because to say we were privileged, I think, is to underestimate what our parents achieved. That's right. right? Oh, when, you think, when you think about what yeah. Mary said, I, we, have, we, have a, we have a friend, uh, Deborah Cheatham, who said yeah. that she wanted to go to Kitty Land. Yeah. <laughs> and her parents said, you don't want to go to Kitty Land. Mm-hmm. We're going to Disneyland. All right. Uh, right. So they yes. found ways. Oh, yes. but, to, but when I think of privilege, I think of it was almost ordained. Yeah. And I don't think I you don't can think say, my parents, my parents worked. My mother was a teacher. My father was a teacher, yeah. football coach, minister. Yeah. He had more jobs than you. We talked about Denise McNair's uh, yeah. father. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He yes. was the milkman, the mailman, yeah. the photographer, and he taught. Right. So they did everything yeah. to give us opportunity. Absolutely. And so, and I think they they worked hard to make sure my that other kids six could. Jobs. Yeah. Six jobs. Yeah. Six. Yeah. Six. Yeah. My, my father. My, my father three left. Jobs. My father had a college degree. He left it to become a steel working a steel because he could make more money working in a steel factory and doing the reading and writing for his white supervisor who was illiterate. illiterate. Uh-huh. All right. He worked in a um, at the railroad station and doing the same thing for the white. And then he worked at the funeral home on the weekend. My mother worked a math and English teacher, but then she did GED in the evening. She tutored kids. Tutored. And no, no, she taught She taught it. people to get the GED. And then she sold insurance to give me the best. Mm-hmm. And yet- and and You had yeah, multiple yeah, jobs? Yeah. My were- father worked three jobs. My parents were not educators like Condi's and Freeman's, but they were passionate about education, and to a large extent, they were Mm self-educated. They grew up in a small farm town about 90 miles from Birmingham, and um, the black high school went to the 10th grade, whereas the white high school went to the 12th grade. Mm -hmm. So my mother got a 10th grade education. My father, unfortunately, had to stop uh, school when he was 13 years old because his father died and he was the only boy who could work the farm. And that hurt him all of his life because he passionately loved education. However, he read everything he could get his hands on, 
newspapers, books. Um, he was the center of conversation at dinner parties my parents would give. Um, I can remember him talking about things in the international world, the Bay of Pigs invasion, um, the Cuban Missile Crisis, what Khrushchev was doing, what was happening in Asia. And I think that's where mm -hmm. I got my love of international things. It, it started there. So, so they both, you know, really educated themselves. Let's, let's go back to the late spring and the um, early autumn of 1963. Another timeline here. We ended the timeline a moment ago with the truce. Now here's what happens. Official Birmingham, business, the business leaders in Birmingham promise to desegregate and they begin to do so. But they can't control all of Birmingham and the white racists continue a fight. Mm -hmm. May 11th, the bombing at the Gaston Hotel you mentioned Mr. Gaston. He was the black businessman who owned the one hotel in town. Now we'd agree he was privileged. The, the yes. He was yeah. privileged. Well, he was rich. I don't <laughs> know he, was, how he was our millionaire. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yes. So there's a May, May 11th, a bombing at the Gaston Motel. May 12th, President Kennedy sends troops to bases near Birmingham, intending to use them to restore order if necessary. May 20th, the Birmingham Board of Education orders the expulsion from school of the more than 1,000 black students who had been arrested in the protests. Two days later, a federal judge reverses the expulsion, ordering the schools to admit those students. July 23rd, summer, school's out. The Birmingham Council votes unanimously to repeal all of Birmingham's segregation laws. August and early September, a series of bombings take place. Among these incidents, there are too many for me to list. Yeah. Two bombings at the home of Arthur Shores, a black civil rights lawyer. Firebombs thrown into the home of Mr. Gaston, A.G. Gaston, once again. September 9th, Alabama Governor George Wallace turns black students away from state universities, including the University of Alabama at Birmingham. September 10th, the day afterwards, President Kennedy federalizes the Alabama National Guard, ordering Secretary of Defense McNamara to enforce the integration of Alabama schools. And this brings us to the Sunday morning of September 15th when the 16th Street Baptist Church is bombed and four girls are killed. Th three were 14 and one was just 11. You remember that morning? I remember that. I was right here in this church because my father was the pastor. My mother was the minister of music. And so we were here early. And uh, it, of course, no cell phones, no, but word started to spread. You could feel the church shutter because it's not that you far from here. Explosion. You felt the explosion. Yes. Oh, yes. And down at 6th oh, Avenue, I'm sure you did too. There. You could feel you it. You were in church that morning as well? I was oh. not. That was one of the few Sundays we did not go to church, but I felt it in yeah. my home. And we all felt it. We all felt it. And yeah. you knew what it was because there'd been so many bombings. And uh, then word started to spread. It mm. had been at 16th Street Baptist Church. It was... Uh, there were four little girls. They were in the basement, in the bathroom, and then the names started to come mm. out. And everybody knew at least one of those little girls, Denise McNair, uh, who had been in this church kindergarten. I have a picture of my father giving her her kindergarten certificate. Um, my, my uncle taught Addie Mae Collins, mm. and he said that Monday morning when he woke up and went to school, her chair was empty, and mm. he just broke down and cried. Mm. Cynthia Wesley, I mean, everybody mm. knew yeah. these little girls. Yeah, mm. yeah. Um, that, that's a day I will never forget. Um, it brings me almost to tears now, because these four little girls would also have been stars. Yes, they would have. Denise McNair was the daughter of one of my elementary school teachers, so she was the youngest, mm -hmm. uh, so not in my age group, but she always came to her mother's classroom after her classes, so knew her very well. Cynthia Wesley um, had just been at my birthday party a few months before. Um, so this was um, an unthinkable, unimaginable, and it, it, uh, it just tears at me to this day. It really does. But, again, difficult questions here. Uh, you've been thinking about this all your lives, so difficult questions for me. But was there, what was the effect? Were there, were, 
Was there any thought that it had gone too far? That maybe it all had pushed the white community too far too fast? That that, that criticism of Dr. King had been validated? No such thought ever in your book? I no. think, if anything, this one uh, did reinforce the sense that these were awful people. Who had to be stood who up to. Who had to be stood up to. And uh, I, I just remember being, for the first time, really scared uh, because my parents, I thought, could could deal with anything. I never worried that I was scared. But that night I asked if I could sleep in their bed. Oh, did you? I did, that night. And this is the difference in ages. Because um, I was a little girl. She was girl. a little girl. Yeah. I remember I was in 10th grade. You were in high school, too. People said to those of us who had gone to jail, if you all hadn't done this, mm. those girls would still be alive. Really? Oh, did goodness. you? I never so heard that. So they did that. say that. Yeah, oh, yes. Yeah. They told King that. that. They told those of us who had gone to jail, if you all hadn't done this, if mm. Dr. King hadn't come in, things would be better. Where was that coming from, oh, Freeman? Yeah. From blacks. Yeah, but, oh, yeah. but I mean, who? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It was very clear. It's yeah. very clear. Very clear. And, and Dr. King felt it when he took courage right. when he came and had to look into the faces of those mothers at the funeral. At the funeral. And I, I was chosen to represent Ullman. And uh, I Ullman came. Ullman High School. Ullman High School. And uh, my parents had said I could come to the funeral. And um, uh, Dr. Bell saw me and <clears throat> he said, come here, son. And I didn't have on an appropriate tie. And at the time, you're supposed to wear a dark tie. And I just put on a tie. And he took off his tie. He had a black tie. And he tied the tie on me. It was so special. Mm -hmm. And he said, you're representing all of us. And uh, he said, just remember, you're representing all of us. And we're proud of you. It was so special. It really was. So but this is the point. Dr. King and I looked in his face. I was sitting up in the back looking right at him. And he said, when he was looking into the faces of those mothers, and you, I'll never forget the three coffins with little Denise's little coffin in the middle. I'd never seen multiple small. coffins, this small coffin. There were only three. One mother refused to allow her oh, daughter. She did. Yeah, it was only three coffins, but the baby, the Denise, they left in the middle. And he said, uh, life is as hard as steel as he looked into those faces. Life is hard, at times as hard as crucible steel. It has its bleak and difficult moment. If one will hold on, he will discover that God walks with him and that God is able to lift you from the fatigue of despair to the buoyancy of hope and transform dark and desolate valleys into sunlit paths of inner peace. And no greater tribute can be paid to you as parents, and no greater epitaph can come to them as children, and where they died, and what they were doing when they died. They died uh, between the sacred walls of the Church of God, and they were discussing the eternal meaning of love. And he was just, mm, what do you say to those mothers when he know what people are telling them, that it's your fault? That was, I'll never forget that feeling. The other thing, though, that I've talked about before, it was the first time in my church, in our church, I had seen white people. On the right-hand side, men of all faith, of all rabbis, Muslims, priests, and it was the first time I'd seen white men crying. I was, think as heinous an event as, as this was, I think it, it's one of the things that really started changing mm -hmm. minds and, and hearts in America, what, in Birmingham and yeah, in America. Yeah. To see, I didn't know white men could cry about black girls being killed. Mm. They had never thought about that. So, so that event, to some component of the white community in Birmingham, that event, mm -hmm. they said, this, is, this has to stop. Not yeah. just, not just yeah. in yeah. Birmingham, but in the country. Uh, yeah. I, I also think that uh, you mentioned the truce and what was happening in black businesses. And I'm going to say something fairly controversial. For a lot of the white community, segregation had become just a pain. Yeah. You know, it was just an inconvenience yeah. in some ways. And yeah. so I remember my dad was highly regarded 
by um, a man named uh, Clay Sheffield, who was the head of counseling, guidance counseling for the whole city. And uh, my father was kind of his protege in some ways. And my mother got a very bad um, infection, a bad uh, bronchi bronchitis. And so she kept trying doctors and nothing was working. And so my father mentioned this to, uh, to Mr. Sheffield. And he said, I want you to take her to this doctor, Dr. Carmichael. And so we went and the black, I, this was probably 1961 or 62 mm. maybe. And the, the waiting room was for the blacks was uh, next to the pharmacy and the paint was peeling and it, you had to go up the back stairs. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dr. Carmichael saw my mother and then he said to my father, Reverend um, Rice, Angelina needs to come every week to see me, but why don't you come after five? And then after five, we could sit in the regular waiting room. Mm. And so mm. you could sort of see that, you, you know, we forget there were people of conscience on, mm -hmm. uh, who were white. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I do think this was catalyzing, but even before then, mm -hmm. um, beginning to think, and my father had a very close relationship with the, the pastor of Shades Valley Presbyterian Church, which is over in Mountain Brook. And uh, they would exchange youth fellowships and so forth. And then Mountain 16, Brook, the, the white enclave. The white, the wealthy white. Wealthy white enclave. But uh, when, when uh, 63 happened, they had to stop because it was so violent. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, there were there were things going on underneath. And we there should were, acknowledge there, that. This is a very very good point. Uh, my father's three jobs. He was a steel worker, and he would uh, go there from seven to three. He would come home, have dinner, get a little rest, and then he would go to his two other jobs, uh, which were to clean two buildings. He was the janitor for Liberty National Insurance Company and for the U.S. Steel Credit Union. Uh, so I tell everybody I got my, uh, my start in finance very early because, <laughs> <laughs> because my brother and I sometimes on a Friday evening or sometimes even during the week, we would go with him and my mother because she would help him sometimes and we would do our homework, you know, while they were finishing up the work. Um, sometimes there were, and it was of course all whites who staffed both organizations. And the ones who were still there were just so very kind mm. to my brother and me, to a person. And whenever they had parties, they would leave little treats for us. So there were people of good conscience and people who really cared about what was going on and didn't agree with what was going two, on. Two, two, two final questions, if I may. And here's the first one. Here we sit. Six decades later, six decades later, your own lives have turned out pretty darn well. An amazing career in, in finance and business, the presidency of a major institution, secretary of state. When you return to this town, do you feel, looking back on those events, that they had to happen that it was right and that the events of 1963 represent a victory? Or when you look at this town today where there's just no racial tension, at least that I've experienced, do you say, well, it was inevitable. This somehow or other segregation had to end. Maybe that wasn't necessary. Maybe we should have, maybe it would all just wash itself away. Out in, in time. So let me say something that's, that's controversial. You know, people think of Gandhi as the Secretary of State. I see her still as this amazing force who still to me was a little girl walking with her father with a book. Because when she left Birmingham, she was only maybe 11 or so, 1965. So when I, we still have this argument, she was privileged, all right, in this. I don't care what she says. She was He's privileged. He's not going to let that one because, go. Right. Let me say why. Because our church and 16th Street were privileged churches. This was a privileged church, a Presbyterian church, a black Presbyterian church is a church of privilege. Now, compared to whites, it's a different word, but in the black community, usually you're gonna have a larger percentage of educated people. In the 60s, only 3% of blacks had a college degree. Let's think that way, and you'd have more blacks. Oh, who could play classical piano, you know, you know, so in that sense, all right, now why do I say that? So. So we were challenged in the sense that there was segregation. We couldn't go to places, all right? Um, today, 
Educated people have done well in America and in Alabama, in Birmingham, the, 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 the head of medicine for the University of Alabama, quite frankly, an African-American, a mentee of mine who recently moved to New York to a big position. So it's a big deal, big deal. At the same time, at the same time, in this state, you still have major challenges. While you may have a, a black who is the mayor, all right, uh, and you have some blacks at the University of Alabama, Birmingham, you've got the same challenges that you have in other cities that the vast majority of black children still cannot read well. And you still have the segregation. So yes, we needed the 60s. And what it showed was that even in the most privileged of churches like 16th Street, where you did have a, a number of educated people. Are you proud of going to jail? I'm very proud. I'm very proud Should to have be. been. Are you proud very of much so. Oh, Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Of we course. made, yes, yes. Of course. But I, I want to come back to what we should celebrate and what we shouldn't. Yes. Right? Good. Mm -hmm. So uh, I won't use the word privilege. I still don't like that <laughs> word. But were we in a position to succeed? Good. Yes. Good. Good. I'm not even the first PhD in my family. Yep. My father's sister yes, was a PhD not. in Victorian <laughs> literature. Right? Yeah, right. Not even, not even first PhD. <laughs> so were we in that sense? Yes, were were yes. we given a head start? Absolutely. Yeah. But that head start came from Mary's parents, yeah. who yes, uh, yes. were were your father, who had dropped out of had to drop out yeah, at thirteen. Yeah, yeah. Labor. Uh, you know, so so in that sense, yeah. the. Head Start, the privilege, if you will, yeah. came from an attitude about yes. what Absolutely. ought to okay. be our lives yes. and our prospects and our horizons. When it was almost like Bull Connor is not going to own our children. Yeah. Right. And so that was the privilege, I that we it. had I people who believed that. It. it is still the case that there are people who are trapped in the witch's brew that is race and poverty. Yes. If you are black and educated and doing well. Yes, there are still some awful things. Uh, you know, the young man, Aubrey, who was running mm -hmm. and was shot. Yeah. It, it happens. Yeah. But for the most part, you can make a great life in America. And now you can go to a restaurant. And now you can go to the University of Alabama. Yeah. And if you want to take your kids to Kitty Land, they'd be happy to have you. Yeah. So that constraint, that ugliness is gone. But we have to remember that we can't celebrate as a country when so many people are left behind. Mm. Mm -hmm. And now, not all of them are black. No. Mm -hmm. If you exactly. live in the rural South, That's exactly right. your prospects are not very good. That's right. And so people like us, what our parents taught us, what our teachers taught us, is not to just enjoy your privilege that you have to extend to others. You have to care about others. We, what Freeman has done as an educator is really remarkable because your students don't all, didn't all come from privilege. Right. That's right. That's right. And, and so, they're all black, black and, and, and white. Yes, yeah. Yeah. and yeah. so yeah. to be able to, ex to extend that hand of, uh, all right, I need to pull you up too. Yeah. Uh, that's what we need to do because we can, uh, we should celebrate what Birmingham produced in us and in others. So, but he, Birmingham's got a lot more work to do, yeah. and so does every every city in this he, country. Yeah, last country. last question again. Yeah. I'm taking you back to to the events of the spring of 1963. Yeah. Students listening. Well, let's put it this way. Freshmen at your institution, yeah. at Stanford were born four decades after these events. Four decades ago, they stand farther from the events of 1963 than you stood from the First World War when those events were taking place. This is old history to them. Can you give me a sentence? I mean, really compress it. What do they need to grasp? What do they but need they to need hold to on to? Is that, is that a lot of life is about attitude and belief. Now, I know, as Freeman and Condi have beautifully pointed out here, that there are many people, many young people, many children, 
um, who live in such circumstances uh, that it's hard to take on that attitude and belief, but, but, but it's made harder by either parents or society or whoever tells them that they are limited in what they can do and what they can be. We were told, despite the circumstances here in Birmingham, that we could do and be anything that we wanted. Our parents believed that. They had that vision. Our teachers believed it. They said, we knew change was coming and that we had to have you in a state of readiness. That's what one of my teachers said to me. And, and that is the message um, that we all need to carry to children today, to parents, particularly those who live in um, uh, circumstances that um, are, are very, very challenging. I chair an organization in Washington um, where our kids come from the poorest areas. There's a lot of violence in their neighborhoods, but we get them mentors, people who can help them see that there are opportunities and that they can be those things as well. That's part of the purpose that we serve. Yeah, yeah I would say to, that there are two messages depending on where you sit. Okay, so if you sit in a position where you have been fortunate enough to be in a, to be able to really take advantage of what America is and mm. what, a, then by all means, go and help somebody who has less. Because the thing that sometimes really gets on my nerves about young people, and that means I'm getting older, uh. <laughs> is uh, that sense that, oh, woe is me, oh, things are, you know, if you go and help somebody who has less than you have, you will never again ask, why do I have so little? You'll say, why do I have so much? Absolutely. Right? And so if you're in that position, then I don't care what you do. Volunteer to go help a kid. Work at the Boys and Girls Club. Do something to help others. If you are that young person, and I work with Boys and Girls Clubs, and I see them, a kid living in a car where the parents are totally dysfunctional. But you can still make it. There are still ways up and out. You have to work very, very hard. But to Mary's mentoring point, there has to be an advocate for that child. Mm -hmm. It has to come from some place. But I, I just feel so badly when kids will sometimes say to me, 75% of the people in my neighborhood never finish school. Mm -hmm. And they think of themselves as a statistic. Mm -hmm. And I say, be in the 25% that does. Yeah. Be in that statistic. So a 19 year old student of yours says, you went to prison? What was that all about? Right, and, and I, say, that? I say that I hear so many elected officials today talking about moral clarity. <laughs> now here's my moral clarity that I talked about when I was 12. We must speak truth to power. And I believe in our country. And so the first thing I'm gonna to say to young people is that we must vote. And I'm not gonna tell you to whom to vote for, but I am gonna say this. Vote for people who tell the truth. Thank you. Vote for people who care about children, okay? Vote for people who care about poor people, right? Who want a country who don't wanna see poor people at the bottom killing each other that we can be better than this as a country where poor people are dying every day. That's, that's what we have to be. We can be so much better as a country. We are better than this as a country. We're better than this. And Birmingham, I think, shows that we can be better than this. Because despite its long and difficult and tortured history, uh, it did produce some of us. Some of us. Yeah. Yes. And, yeah. oh, by the way, uh, it is a different place than it was. When I would travel around the world as secretary and people would say, how can you speak for America? Your country was slave owning. You grew up in segregated Birmingham. And I would say, since when did people tell you that democracy was ever a finished product? Mm. And Great in point. fact, <laughs> that is the one lesson that Birmingham shows. Mm -hmm. Condoleezza Rice, mm -hmm. 
Freeman Hrabowski, Mary Bush, thank you. Thank you, you're Peter. For Uncommon Knowledge, filming today at Westminster Presbyterian Church in Birmingham, Alabama. I'm Peter Robinson. Thank you for joining us. What a beautiful sunny day. Isn't it gorgeous? We got very fortunate about that. Did you see Dr. King at all? I did. Uh, I saw his one of his speeches. Um, I saw him um, leading and marching close to our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. I never uh, met him. I met his, his children and I, I knew uh, Coretta Scott King. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, yeah, I remember him well. Condi, I have to say, I, uh, prepping for our, our visit here today, yeah. I read and reread the letter from Birmingham, Birmingham jail. jail. Yes, yes. This document, all that he was doing, comes out of his notion of the church. And children of God. The children of God. If you are a child of God, then how could you treat other children of God, God this way? He also, uh, we, we tended, you know, what happens with a figure like uh, Dr. King is that over time, people put on him whatever their thoughts right. are and their right. beliefs and their ideology. And uh, we, we have to keep going back to the essence of who he was. He believed in this country, actually. Yes. He believed this country could redeem itself. Yes. He believed in a colorblind content of your character. Um, and, and yet sometimes he's, uh, he's used uh, to talk about other ways of thinking about race. And so, uh, you know, and he would have a, a long legacy actually beyond the civil rights legacy because he would get concerned about human rights across the world and uh, the treatment of workers and, and the like. But the essence of what he did here was to try to make America uh, be what it said it was.